right. Good evening. Um, my name is Steve Clegg. I'm the interim pastor at Second Baptist Church, and this is our midweek Bible study. And we are going to finish up our study on marriage. Um, we are in First Peter, chapter three. Um, the scripture was one through seven um, for the marriage discussion. And we're going to pick up and do a little bit on eight through ten on the next section. And like I said, it's, we just kind of got ran out of time last time, so we're going to wrap up one and get to the other. Um, before we get into that, um, I'll cover the announcements and uh, prayer requests. Um, Sunday school at nine, faithful workers class. Like I say, meet in the sanctuary. Sunday, um, Sunday morning service is at ten. I'll get spit out here in a minute. Um, then we're doing eighty-seven point nine transmit on FM. Um, for those that want to stay in a car, um, like I say, COVID's going around, flu's going around, the crud's going around as I call it up on um, Western Carolina University. Um, so a lot of different things going out. So if you feel not feeling well, but still want to be able to come in here to service long, you use um, your car, or if you just don't feel um, like you take a chance of getting sick, you can do that also. Hmm, excuse me. Then also we're putting a message out on Facebook. Um, and then Saturday, um, this Saturday, 23rd, is our Senior Citizens Meal at the Fellowship Hall. That's at 5 p.m. And then month of September, we're collecting the hygiene items for the Christmas shoe boxes. Remember, no liquids, no gels. That means no toothpaste. Um, no shampoos, no mouthwashes, but other hygiene items um, for the kids. You can send them. Um, that, like I said, that box is in the hallway. Then also, um, October 1st, we're planning our homecoming dinner. Um, and the meal will be at 12. At 12, um, following service. So, like I say, we'll have that. And then also, remember, the food pantry sponsored by the Methodist Church. The box is in the hallway. And then also, we're collecting the pop can tabs for McDonald's house. Um, a lot of different prayer requests, and I'll try to update those. I know um, we got a few updates. Um, Marion Edwards, Jada Clayton, Karen Clegg, David and Connie Warren, Matthew and Jennifer Ward, Mac McMurray, Shannon and Daryl Brick, Chloe Akers, Janet House, Billy McKenzie, Linda and Cornelius Hunt, um, the Fish family, Kyle Edwards, Taylor Fields, Ashley Blanks, Lee Stevens, Cynthia McMorrow and family, Ashley and Zaley Emmon. And baby Zaley is supposed to come home this week. I haven't, um, so like I say, there's some setbacks, but a year and a half, almost a year and a half um, in the hospital. Um, never been to her own home. Um, so like I say, a major milestone for baby Zaley, and we'll just keep praying for her. Um, BJ Norris, Tommy Eford, Rosemary Taylor, Louise and Ron Rising, Melody Oakley, Jennifer Milligan, Sheila, Mill Sheila Milligan, um, Hunter, Hunter Kinlaw, um, just special prayer for him, um, going through some issues there. Um, Jim Miss Kelly, Ruby Johnson, Cheryl Barker, Kathy Beanie, Ronnie King, Barbara Walters, um, continue to pray for her, for her eyes. Um, Helen Rogers, Frederica Aswell, Liliana Brutus and family. Mary Beard, Earl Davis, Nell Willis, Dwayne Milligan, Jeanette Allen, um, School systems, the children, the pulpit committee, church, laws, nation's leaders, troops and their families, police officers, and then the pastors and their families. Added to that, um, just continue to remember Connie. She had a better week, um, having some medical issues. Better week this week, but continue to remember her. Chase Allen, um, that's Annie Stevens' grandson who was having the seizures. Um, have not heard an update on him, but he's, I know he's heading to a specialist. Um, Jeanette Allen, as we mentioned earlier, um, battling um, ovarian cancer. Um, praise report, I had mentioned last week, um, Riley Burns, um, that's the baby of Dylan Burns, um, broke out blisters and then went lethargic. Um, they had to take her children hospital. Doing much better, so that's good. Um, also, Tristan Turlington, um, that's the two-year-old that drowned and they worked on for over an hour. Please remember Tristan. Um, still not out of the woods. Uh, a lot of prayer needed there. Um, remember Betty Holland and William Holland, and they're praying for um, salvation for William. Um, different people traveling, so like say traveling mercies. Um, praise report: Harry Carter is home from the hospital after suffering his major heart attack um, last Sunday. Um, and um, Tammy um, was annoyed Sunday morning for her son-in-law Daryl. Um, just continued to pray for him. Um, Patty Carter, praise report, um, surgery went well. They think they got all the cancer um, in her surgery, so that, that's good. 
um, Bill Lawrence um, having a colonoscopy, and then Jennifer's sister um, was not dealing with several issues, not doing well. So pray for her. Um, continue to remember. Um, let's see. I got another section here. Okay. Um, the people in um, Libya, um, they're continuing to find more flood victims. Like I say, the death toll, well over 11,300. That was the last number I picked up. I haven't looked it up the last day or two. 10,000 missing. Um, this death toll could just really get extreme, which really is thing. And now you got to think about how long we are after the flooding, um, the area that you're living in. And like I say, it's really getting bad. Um, corpses they're finding just stacked up in places um, where the floods just kind of left them. Um, just a lot of you can just think about all the different things of what happens when you have a flood and then bodies are not discovered for quite a while. It's getting bad over there. Also, remember the Morocco um, earthquake victims, like I say, death toll was up over 2,900. And like I say, as they're getting into some of the different regions and all, they're just finding entire villages where there's just not a building stand. It's just totally those people have lost everything um, in a lot of those situations. Um, pray support, um, Casey Otto, doing excellent um, with school. So like I say, getting good reports there. Um, then um, Shirley Pate shared with us um, one of the shooting victims um, recently. Um, by the name of Allison, um, was in their church, um, was recovering well. Um, she had been shot in the abdomen, um, was able to get back in church. So that's a great uh, thing. And then um, Charles Carver, um, his wife Marie passed, so remember that. And then also remember um, Bobby Faircloth, Fair, Faircloth, excuse me, um, understanding possibly putting a pacemaker in for Bobby. So I like saying many of you know him. A lot going on. Like I say, the prayer list is getting quite lengthy. Um, and I always know that this is the tip of the iceberg. Um, there's always much more um, prayer needed. Um, so like I said, continue to remember those. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Our gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, we just thank you for this day and thank you for many blessings. And Father, we just pray for those on our prayer list, Lord. You know each and every circumstance. And Father, you even know more. And But Father, we do thank you and give you the praise for those that we're seeing, those that have, re that have healed from energy, injury those that are getting stronger um, baby Zayla getting ready to come home from the hospital a shooting victim that survived and was able to be back in church um, like I say others have gotten good reports and you know I went to the doctor today and I got excellent report from my doctor so um, moving in the right direction um, still got ways to go but numbers are turning the way we want them to go so like I say even my own life, you're, Lord, you're healing me, and I appreciate that, and I'm just thankful for it. And Father, we just lift up those on our prayer list. We have others who are struggling. Um, the little boy, Tristan, is just needing prayer, Lord, after that drowning. And, Lord, it's just amazing that he's still there. So that's just your hand there, Lord. And we're just praying that you'll just bless that child and be with Annie Stevens' um, grandchild, Lord. They're suffering from seizure, don't know, and Dylan's um, daughter Riley, the, the, you know, getting better after being so lethargic. It's scary when the small ones are sick, Lord. But it's marvelous to see them when you just bless them and allow them to come alive. We just expect children to be bright and mobile and moving, Lord. And when they're not, it's scary. And Father, we just pray for all those on our prayer list. Father, we have a great many that are dealing with just different issues. We have... The, those that are dealing with cancers, Lord, and some that have recently gotten good reports and others that are battling on. Father, we have others that have had surgeries um, and are healing from those. We have heart issues, Lord, breathing issues, lung issues, um, diabetes, um, autoimmune. The list just goes on. And it just reminds us how frail we are and how dependent we are upon you, Lord. And Father, we just pray that you'll bless each and every one of them. And Lord, be with those who've lost loved ones. It's not easy. And Father, we're, you know, we suffer the loss of one here, you know, and a family member here or a friend here. And it's tragic and it's hard. 
But Lord, we look over around the world at these tragedies. Some people have lost entire families. Some areas there's entire communities gone. Lord, the devastation and the heartache. Father, be with those people also. Bless them, Lord, as they have to come through these hard times after going through floods and earthquakes. And Father, and so much of those nations are not the best. Their leaders aren't always concerned about the people. And Father, we just pray for them. And Father, we just pray for our children here at home. We pray for our schools. Bless them, Lord. Make our schools stronger. Make them places of learning and growing and maturing, not of danger and violence and sickness. And Father, we pray for our first responders. Bless them, Lord. Bless our police officers, our firefighters, ambulance, emergency workers, all those, Lord. Bless and keep them, Lord. And may they return home safe in the, each and every day. And Lord, be with our military wherever they serve, men and women around the world, Lord. Keep them safe. Bring them home safely at the end of the tours. And those that are here, keep them safe here. So as many of are injured in training and different events that happen here. Father, bless and keep all of our men and women in our military safe. And Father, we pray for the road workers as construction continues and is picking up in some areas. And Father, we just pray that people will be patient and watch out for each other. That everybody can arrive at their destination safely and no one get hurt. And Father, we pray for our nation. Pray for our nation to be united to care for one another. Father, it's a hard concept in this world that Satan continues to put into us to look out for number one, to watch out for your own needs and not everybody else's. Father, may our hearts not be so calloused. Father, we know there's a remnant and I pray that that remnant will grow that remnant will plant seeds and that lives will be changed. Father, give our nation a heart. Move it spiritually towards you, Lord. That we can be the nation you'd have us to be. Father, forgive us of our sins. Forgive us where we've gone astray. Bless us with good leaders and guidance that we as a nation can turn back to you, but also as people and a community and all that which is within the nation. Father, bless the churches. Bless our church and all that we do. May we have a heart to share the gospel, to compel people to come into the doors, that they may worship and grow to you, Lord. We pray for the salvation of the lost. Use us to reach them. Bless this time. For it's in the precious name of Jesus we pray. Amen. All right. Um, like I say, a little bit of sinus issue here. We'll get through it. Um, last time we didn't finish up our discussion on marriage. And like I say, we're just, I'm not trying to set any speed records getting through um, First Peter. And that's fine. Um, but we just... It just got too long, and I just didn't want to drag it out. So tonight we'll finish that up and get into the first section of um, the next topic. Um, and as we were talking last time, you know, we had flipped the coin. We uh, so much the first Peter it, it was talking to the women because remember the women were going through a major transition in their life. Um, as you know, what was being presented in the gospel is not what they're seeing in society. It was not what they're used to. So to hear that. Um, like I say, they were valued, was you know a major thing to them. Uh, but also that they had a freedom that they didn't have before. And I know it's a spiritual freedom because obviously in 
a lot of the cultures um, during the early church age, a lot of women were treated, wives were treated like property in, a mar- in many cases, a very chauvinistic society in most cases. Um, so they dealt with a lot of upper hill battles. But Peter is talking to them, you know, as Christians, how they should act and how they possibly could win their husbands over to Jesus if their husbands weren't saved. So the, all that gets into this. And like I say, as many times people will read this, and especially men, they'll read, they'll read the part about the hot wives being submissive to husbands, and boom, that's all they read. But no, Peter turns the table on them. And we had started turning the tables last time, and or flipped the coin, however you want to put it. And he's talking to the husbands about how to treat the wives. And um, like I say, man, I'm get hung up on you know the wife being submissive. But you know, if I put this really to the husbands, are you worthy, or have you earned the right for the wife to be submissive to? Now I know the Bible tells her to be submissive in order to win her husband over. Um, but you know, also as Christian husbands, you know. If you look at it just in, to that group, are you worthy for her to treat you that? Or, or you know, and what I'm getting at is the bottom line is you know, one as a husband, do you respect her? Um, do you respect your wife? Do you protect her? Do you provide for her? Do you see her as a partner, as an equal, so that she can have be submissive, but also be able to be submissive without fears or being felt like she's being manipulated or taken advantage of? See, all this creates reservations within the wife when the scripture tells her to be um, submissive, but then they see a husband that just, I don't want to say doesn't deserve it, but it gives them fear to be submissive to him because of all the different issues and all. So, you know, inside your marriage, there should not be fear between a husband and a wife. And when I talk about fear, one of the greatest fears is that one will walk out on the other. You know, and that was obviously a concern with the early church women because their husband possibly if he was practicing religion was probably a pagan religion for her to start speaking about Christ and behaving as a Christian it would be um, alien to him and he was probably thinking she's not acting right at all and so she would have the fear of her husband even walking out on her um, that was a real fear for them but in a Christian home that should never be a fear but yet you see the divorce rate and separation rate inside the church so high that it is a real fear even for Christian wives with Christian husbands treating them submissively and respectfully trying, or hopefully they're trying to, but even that, there's a fear within these marriages. What have you done as a husband to alleviate those fears? And that's a hard thing to do. Because what that means is you have to have a major trust. So what are you doing in your marriage to make sure you have a major trust between you and your spouse? So, like I say, Peter flips the table here, and he's talking to husbands. And you know, remember, husbands are to treat the wife as Christ treats the church, and Jesus gave everything for the church. And also, the next point, and you know, we'll get into with this is, husbands, do you honor your wives? And you know, the chivalry may be dead, and but the husband still needs to be that knight in shining armor, right? I mean, he's the protector, he's the provider, he's watching out, and all, and. And does he treat the you know the wife like, excuse me, a princess? You know, do you see her as a princess, or do you see her as some, you know, I don't know what I don't want to say peasant, but you know, some husbands look at their wives like peasants, as servants, rather than women as adults. Um, some of them treat them like kids. Some of them are just it, it just gets really weird. I shouldn't say weird, but really horrible how some wives are treated. But the term princess here, and, and why the commentary brings it out, is by what, by the way, the name Sarah means what? Princess. And so, you know, do you, Sarah was the one that was being submissive to her husband. And, you know, so she's a princess. And so who was her knight in shining armor? Obviously Abraham was. And all. And so are you your knight, in, are you the knight in shining arm for your wife? Remember, you know, Peter did not, you know, suggest that the wife is a weaker, weaker vessel mentally or morally, you know. But, you know, physically she's built a little weaker. But morally, mentally, uh, spiritually, she's not necessarily weaker. Matter of fact, many women's, many women, women are stronger than their husbands when it comes to some of these things. And you say, well, that's not possible. Oh, absolutely it's possible, especially when I get into 
um, the mentally and the spiritually realm of it because many women are much more educated than they used to be. Uh, remember, used to education was restricted from women. Now, in our culture, it's, it's you know it's pushed. It's, it's encouraged. Let them get an education. And used to there are certain fields that women didn't go into, and now they're today they're saying, hey, yes, go into science, go into math. So, like I say, women are very intelligent. Not that they weren't before. It's just that the fact they weren't given an opportunity for a proper education. But when it came to things around the home and how to manage things and all, they were very great at it. Um, so, like I say. We can't look at women in a at down at women, and as maybe that's where I'm trying to get to in a roundabout way. God didn't create them lesser. True, they are formed from a rib, but that doesn't mean them mean that they are lesser. Because remember, we, we are both heirs with Christ. It doesn't say that we are a major heir and she's a minor. No, it says we are both heirs with Christ, so that we are on equal terms when it comes to our inheritance from God. So God views her equally as a child, just as the men are. So like I say, with that, um, so there's things that you know, are the, that are you that knight in shining armor? And obviously, like I say, and even I'll say this because now I, I see different things. There's always the um, odd thing out. Men are not always physically stronger than wives. Um, in a lot of ways, I think women are stronger than men in a lot of ways, um, physically. Because, you know, when you skirt getting into to the childbirth and all. But the thing of it is, the husband should treat his wife like an expensive, beautiful, fragile vase. Um, something that is precious, something that is treasure, something that you don't want to get broken, something that you don't you want to be, you know. Behold, you know, the term that I used to teach my boys is you treat your mama like gold. She is precious to you. You need to treat her like gold. That was what I used to tell my boys and all. But your your wife is to be precious to you. You want no harm or damage to come to her and all. So, you know, think about it in that thing. You know, do you honor her? Do you take care of these things? Do you, or are you her knight in shining armor? Now, when a young couple starts dating, the boy is always courteous and thoughtful. Remember, you can go back to your dating days. That's, I don't know if it's really much today, but... Back then, you and the men would open the door for the women and go around the car and you know, hold your umbrella, get an umbrella, yeah, whatever. All those things were there. were always very gentleman-like and treating them very ladylike, right? But after they got married and soon after they get married, all of a sudden, this all kind of goes out the door with a lot of them. And, you know, it shouldn't be that way. If you if you wanted to win her with being a gentleman, why did you stop being a gentleman after you married her? Isn't she more precious to you now, being married to her, than she was when you were just dating her? We get the wrong thoughts in our head. And, all. and because of this, we, you know we start creating unhappy homes and unhappy marriages because we quit treating them as something precious. As something that we really want. We take them for granted. We put expectations on them for them to do certain things. And we got to be careful with that. Because it always seems like the man can put a ton of expectations on a woman, but if a woman puts an expectation on a husband, then it's called nagging careful what roads you start down right so like I say we should, there's always time to be courteous there's always time to be thankful there's always time to be grateful and so that needs to stay in the marriage and like I say it's little things but little things can add up resentment grows out of small hurts it doesn't grow just because of one thing it's a constant series of things and it's marriage doesn't fall overnight Marriage falls over time because of different things. You say, well, you know, they're in, you know, they weren't faithful. Well, fine, but something drove them not to be faithful. They just didn't wake up some morning and say, I'm going to be unfaithful. That's not how it works. Something drove them there. And usually it's the little things that add up to create that. And all. So, you know, when we look at that, you know, husbands and wives need to be honest with each other. They need to admit when someone hurt, when they're hurt. And sometimes we ha we don't like hearing that, oh, what I did hurt them. Um, 
a large part of my marriage and, and, and everything, and I still battle with it at times because I come from a very sarcastic family. Um, it can be calloused at times. Karen, on the flip side, is like her grandma and all. She's very sensitive. Well, calloused and sarcastic and sensitive don't mix real well. And where a lot of times, if I was joking, she didn't see it as joking. Now she's gotten better and recognizes my joke a little bit and then dishes it back and all. But I had to stop a lot of my actions and I'm like, wow. Because she's like, you're hurting me. I don't like to be talked to that way. I don't like that kind of joke. I don't like that kind of sarcasm. And, all. and unfortunately, all three of our children are sarcastic. And all. And so we had to be careful with that. And so, like I say, I've had to adjust how I talk. And you say, well, you should. Well, you know, out in the business world, out in the, with a lot of people, you know, in the things I deal with a lot in the industry and whatnot, there isn't a lot of sensitivity in between people. It's very callous. It's very brutal at times. Um, if nothing, it's just at least cold because nobody's like, oh, well, you're just a coworker. You're not, you know, a close friend. I mean, you, you can get different things. So, you know, harsh words happen. Um, sarcasm happens. And uh, so, like I say, inside of marriage, you can't have that. You have to be sensitive to how each person feels about the way you talk to them, how you treat them, you know, your gestures and your emotions, you know. When was the last time you said thank you after a meal? Or when was to say, hey, you know, you've worked hard today. Let me take you out to there. I mean, there's things to do. There's things that we have to put to. But if we're not careful, what the, we'll let the selfishness of the world creep into our marriages. So be careful there. If I don't get back on track, we're going to get long-winded. I'm not going to finish where I'm going to get at night. All right. A husband can disagree with his wife. And a wife can disagree with her husband without losing respect and honor for each other. It's okay to disagree. How you handle it makes the difference. As a spiritual leader inside the home, which is the husband's role, the husband sometimes has to make decisions that are not popular, but he can still act with courtesy and respect. I, you know, I understand where you're coming from, and, you know, I've weighed this out, but I still think the best course of action is this. Don't just discard and say, well, I don't like what you're thinking and go away. That's wrong. You know, if you're making that type of hard decision, did you really need to sit down and have a long discussion about this is what we need to do. And do point and counterpoint because sometimes you'll find out in a longer discussion, maybe you're being hasty. Maybe you have a mindset and you're not willing to think through. And all. Be careful with those decisions. Not saying they should never happen with a marriage, and sometimes a husband will have to do them. But don't do them flippantly, and don't do them without great respect for your wife. And all. As I say, wives, you know, the mentality that women are not smart is a joke. As I've shared with you, my, my you know, brother in law's wife, my sister, she's absolutely more financially savvy than he is because she's got a degree in it so why would he not listen to her when it comes to financial decisions you know there's all those type of things giving honor means that the husband respects his wife's feelings thinkings and desires you can't always say we're going after my dreams and not hers i have these desires and this is what we're going to do no Hers are just as valuable as yours. And that's what Peter's saying. He's flipping this thing on and saying, you, you've got to have a balance. It can't be a one-sided marriage where the husband dominates and everything bows down to him. Peter's saying it don't work that way. And God balances the marriage and also the husband needs what his wife has in her, her personality and likewise and good qualities in the husband, you know. Like I say, I come from a very kind. Karen has taught me sensitivity over the years. I'm a much more sensitive person than I used to be. And all, she's also helped me with my temper. You know, whether she thought so or not at times. You know, I, my hot, I'm honest, hot-headed, and some of that is obviously in both my sensitivity and my temper. God's had a great hand in that. 
And sometimes one of the greatest things that brought my temper under control was God putting things in perspective. Most times when you have a temper issue, or should I say sometimes you have a temper issue, you're out of perspective. You're seeing things only the way you want to see them. Can't do that. You have to stop and pull back. And the wife helps that, okay? You know, as here's an analogy they put in more of the commentaries. You know, the husband must be a thermostat in the home. He has to me measure, okay, things get too tense, things you know, too hot, too cold, whatever. But in reality, he may be the thermostat trying to control it. But the wife's the thermometer. She's actually going to tell him where it's at, if he'll listen. Sometimes we get a very misconceived idea about what the children are thinking or whatever because we're not in a home or not spending having those rides home from school with them like our wife is, you know, depending on our work situation and whatnot. And all of a sudden, sometimes she's just going to give you a reality check and says, that's not what the kids are thinking. That's not what they want. And all. So, we work together. So you have to be sensitive to her. You have to be sensitive to what she's telling you. But is this you'll grow. And also, finally, the husband has to consider and see to the spiritual needs. You know, that your prayers are not him. That's what it's talking about. He says, if you're not tending to these things, Peter says your prayers are hindered. So if we're not taking care of our marriage, we're not taking care of the spiritual needs of the family, what happens to our prayer? It's hindered. And we can't experience what well, how do you, what happens to a family when your prayers are hindered? You know, if God's not hearing your prayers because you got these things that you're not taking care of and you're not doing right, you know, you don't want your prayers hindered. And also Peter, you know, he, obviously Peter's assumption is husband and wives would pray together, and often they do, and often they don't. And all. Um and if you're not careful, you know, that can create problems and issues. Um because what happens, I mean, a lot of people look, well, unconverted people, they have homes and they don't pray with each other. So, you know, it's not necessary in a Christian home. Well, absolutely it is. Um, so, like I say, a husband and wife need to have their own private prayer times. So obviously, we have our own issues we're dealing with, our own whatever and all, and it help us grow. But also, you know, there has to be a time of sharing, you know. And uh, if we want God's best in our marriage, and we need to pray together. Um... So, like I say, it works together. Um, there's also um, some families that are very great at family devotions and family Bible time. That's great. If you can do that and work that into your family, that's a great thing. Um, but if it's not in devotions and it needs to be in how you're making decisions and it needs to come up in discussions and all. Sometimes a family devotion sometimes turns out to be a car ride down the road and you start talking about something and you have the opportunity to teach somebody or to discuss it from a biblical standpoint. And uh, I've had those type of discussions and all uh, um, when the boys are coming up and all. So, and even with Rachel at different times, we'll talk about things and, and it's just conversation. It wasn't a devotion time, but it was a conversation that stressed around these things. Um, as I mentioned earlier, the husband and wife are heirs together, so the wife's mission is she has to keep the husband in consideration. God wants our best in our marriage. He wants our marriage to be the best it can be. So like I say, different things. But like I say, you just can't take this and, and say, oh, we listen to it and we're done. Go back and study and read it. Dig up your own commentaries, find your own thing, and go through this and really dig this material up. Um, like I said, we're finishing this section up. So, in preparing this Bible study, and all, there's one of the commentaries uh, has this suggested reading to, um, reading area and all, whatnot. But it has an inventory, and and it really goes back and kind of summarizes what what Peter's talking about. And so, when we go back and you have this inventory and talk, these are good topping talking points between your husband and wives, right? Um, ask yourselves, and like I say, you need to ask yourself this, but then maybe you need to have a discussion on each one of these, and you know, say, when we look at our marriage, are we competitors or are we partners? Now, it's very easy to say we are partners, but when you do that, can you justify how you're partners? 
because sometimes you'll find out you might be competing more than working together. One try, you know, and you see it in marriages. You see it. Well, I'm always trying to show, you know, up show the other one and all, and this so I look better, or you know, the kids have a closer relationship with me than her. I mean, it gets in all kind of forms, or how you deal with in-laws and outlaws, so to speak. All right. Second question it says, are we helping each other become more spiritual? Now that's a major one. If I would ask you, or you know, if I would ask Karen, how am I helping you become more spiritual? What would the answer be? Or what would she answer? What would my answer be to her if she says, how do I help you be more spiritual? Can you cite examples? Can you cite ways that they're doing it? Other than just saying, oh, you're being a good wife or you're being a good husband. Can you put realistic answers to that? All right. Third question says, are you depending on the externals or the eternals? Are you worried about the world or are you worried about the eternals? You know, have a lane. You know? Do you look at the artificial things around or the real things. See, there's a lot of superficial things around marriages. Then there's the real things that really matter. When you get a gut check, you'll realize what the real things are. All right? Because like I say, God gave me the gut check more than once. And it helped me put my marriage in a much better perspective. Many couples will tell you they've had gut checks. Where God has revealed to them or shown them or gave them a thing that got their marriage woken up. I shouldn't say wakened up, but, you know, it was like, oh, this is what the important part of my marriage is. The other stuff's superficial. But here's the real guts of my marriage. Hopefully it's not something that's really life-shattering when God does it to you. But like I say, make sure you're focusing on the real keys to your marriage and not the superficial, and that's the part that everybody looks at. All right. Do you understand each other better today than you used to? Not to any, oh, well, I know she you know, has this habit or he has that habit. That's not what I'm talking about. Do you really understand how the other person thinks, processes, and goes through things, how they feel emotionally about items? Do you understand where their likes and their interests are? You know, we talked about all these different things. Um, are you sensitive to each other? Or you say, well, I always, yeah, be careful. A lot of times the answer is, you know, I treat her nice. That's not being sensitive to her. Just because you treat her nice doesn't necessarily mean you're being sensitive to her. It just means you're being courteous, which is you need to be courteous. She's sensitive to you. Well, I'm a good wife. I treat him well. That's not what I asked. Understand the term and answer the question honestly. Are you seeing God's answers to prayers in your marriage? Now, there's a real spiritual gut check question. Are you seeing God's answers to prayers inside your marriage? If not, there's an area that you definitely have to work on. All right. And then are we enriched because of our marriage or are we less because of our marriage? Another one. All right. None of that's going to help you unless you answer honestly. None of it's going to help you unless you can discuss it and work through it. And like I say, um, it's going to help you, you know, realize this marriage. But remember, those lasting, the, true, uh, the lasting and true change will not come about unless God's involved. So you say, well, we need to be more sensitive to each other. Okay. Fine, but how are you going to be more sensitive? You can say, well, I'm just going to do a better job. That's not good enough. You know, because what you do is temporary. It's the change in your heart and who you are that will make you permanently more sensitive. You know, so you need to work through this and see God's way of being sensitive to each other, God's way of being more sensitive to each other, and the means by how he wants you to get to that point. True change and improvements are only going to come when you involve God. Because remember, God's the center of your marriage. All right. 
So like I say, you, you can grow in your marriage and you both should be growing in your marriage. Both growing closer to each other, but also growing in God. Marriage is not to be taken lightly. Um, so go back, revisit these Bible studies, you know, these times and play them through. And maybe it'll help you. And um, no matter um, whether you're a newlywed or someone's been married to you, all marriages grow and get better with God. That's just bottom line. Take God outside of marriage and you're living in the world and it can go anywhere. All right, that's when we wrap that up. Let's get into the next section. Because um, like I said, I can talk about um, just all kinds of stuff with marriage, but I think I, I've hit enough and I am um, got into the rambling, so I need to be careful. Um, all right, next section um, starts with 1 Peter 3.8. When you prepare to do something, and that's really, I'm going to really shift gears here, right? When you prepare to do something, do you prepare for the worst or do you prepare for the best? Um, and I have to be honest here. My mother often said, prepare for the worst and hope for the best. I understand that because she's always saying, you know, things can happen you need to be prepared for. But the problem of it is, and what Peter's going to tell us, is something different. And like I say, Rachel, my daughter, always overpacks. You know, it may rain, it may be hot, it may be cold, whatever. Um, and, and like say with us having a with us having a dog and it being her dog, and all she, we take a backpack for our dog. We don't just take a little bit of food and whatever. No, when we travel, we take a backpack for our dog. And you know, and she has all the different things the dog might need. You know, in case it gets hurt, whatever. And, and I admit sometimes it's come in handy. But again. It's a lot. The flip side of this is when talking with um, Rachel, um, and she was telling me about um, her boyfriend and whatnot. She says he's the opposite of her, um, they, and he packs only the bare necessities. And she said that he must come from his scouting days because he, he would, you know, he realized anything he he wanted to take with him, he had to carry. And when you're out, and they do a lot of hiking, a lot of um, outdoors type stuff. When he was growing up so if he wanted it he had to carry it and so he realized you know my load's not so heavy if i don't take as much and so he has the very thing he takes the bare necessities and then adapts with what he's got um even to the point at times he, he doesn't even take a tent he's fine with throwing a tarp on the ground and a blanket and he's good i mean he, he's not even worried about taking a tent in a lot of cases when he was growing up with boy scouts so you see the two perspectives and how it changes your actions. That's the whole point of that. I'm not saying one's right or one's wrong. But your perspective changes your actions and it can change the results. Um, the story um, in the commentary, and I, 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 like, I always like a lot of these commentary stories because I think they're funny. Um, he's talking about a devoted pastor who was facing a very serious surgery. And a friend visited the pastor in the hospital, you know, usually you get the pastor visiting the person in the hospital, and this kind of, kind of flip. You know, the friend comes to see the pastor who's in the hospital getting ready to have this very serious surgery. And the pastor tells us something very interesting happened today. And the friend's like, what? And he's like, you know, one of the nurses looked at my chart. She came in my room, was looking at my chart, and, and said, well, I guess you're preparing for the worst. Well, that's always an a nurse that makes you feel better, right? I guess you're preparing for the worst because, like I say, it's a very serious surgery. And he looked at her and he, he and all, and he smiled and said, "No, I'm preparing for the best. I'm a Christian, and God has promised to work, you know, all things good, together for the good." And all, and he said, "Boy, she just dropped the chart and left the room in a hurry." I mean, she, that wasn't what she expected. It caught her totally off guard. The thing of it is. How you look going into it has a great impact. You can go into a surgery thinking, you know, the very worst is going to happen, and you can literally make your body weaker and put a thoughts in your head that can make things worse. There's been all kinds of studies done with the mindset of a patient impacts their recovery. And that's not just, you know, um, psychological mumbo-jumbo. Literally, you can impact your recovery. You know, we often talk about, you know, laughing is the best medicine. There's a lot of stuff that says, but you have a positive laughing attitude. You can have a great impact on your body. 
and all. And so Peter is writing this letter to the Christians and all, and they're getting right, they're facing a fiery trial. Remember, persecution is on the rise of the Christians. Yet his approach, rather than, oh, you're getting ready to go through this fiery trial, or you may go through this fiery trial, or all this persecution, and you need to be prepared for the worst, and blah, 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 blah. You know, it's like, no, you need to prepare for the best. You need to be optimistic and positive, because the whole thing, and we're, we're not going to get through all of them, but he talks about them, about three areas and all. But it... In order to prepare for the best, they had to do certain things. And there's three key things that he gives them, instructions. And because God wants the best, you know, in the worst of things, God can bring out the best. And I think we've all seen that at times, if we we're honest about it. And all, because I know that there's some things that happen and we don't like going through it. But what comes out the other side is for our best. And so the first thing that Peter talks about is to cultivate Christian love. And that's in verses 8, eight through 10. Chapter 3, 8 through 10. It says, Finally, be ye of one mind, having compassion one another. Love as brethren. Be pitiful, be courteous. Not rendering evil for evil or railing for railing, but contrariwise blessing, knowing that ye are unto called that ye should inherit a blessing get that be a blessing and all because you're going to inherit a blessing there's a blessing coming out of this now we've talked about it before and you're going to continue to talk about in Peter the theme a theme that keeps coming is love. Um, not only God's love, but also our love for one another, our love to God and God's love to us, but also our love for each other as Christians. And Peter had, had to learn this as an important lesson for himself. Remember, Peter has not always been a cultural, civil person that um, we kind of see here more so in this letter. He had a hard time. And you have, remember how patient Jesus had to be with Peter? That's why we like to label Peter the hothead sometimes, or the extremist sometimes, or whatever. We'll give him a bad rap in a sense. You know, he'd go from, you know, oh, I've got this and figured it all out spiritually, to, you know, one jump off the cliff where he's just going the wrong way. You know, remember Jesus even says, Satan, get thee behind me, and we refer him to Peter. You know, because Peter had this emotional swing, you could call it, or whatever, mindset. And so, you know, we should begin with loving God's people. And that's what verse 3 eight, he says. And the word finally here means to sum it all up. Not, oh, it's over, it's the end. That's not, it's not fine. It's finally. And, all, and so it's saying really to sum it all up, to just as the whole law was summed up as love, so should our the whole of human relationships be is summed up and fulfilled in love. You know, if you're going to have a true relationship, it's got to be out of love. Now, is that to say you love everybody so that, you know, you want to No, not marry everybody. It's not talking about that. It's the love that we should have just as we love Christ. We, you know, not saying that we put them above or equal to Christ. But what I'm saying is it's that type of love. And we should love each and every Christian. And all. So that's the first phase. So you start out with God's people, right? And this love is evidenced by unity. Uni means uni does not mean uniformity. So that doesn't mean we love other Christians and we all think alike. That's not what we're saying. What it means is that there is cooperation in the midst of diversity. You ever have a bunch of people? You got all these different, but somehow you got to figure out how to get something done. And what it means is we have to work together to get to the the final answer, right? You may all have a different way of getting it, but if you're ever going to get there and solve it and get to the, you all have to eventually come together and put aside, you know, your different things and work together in unity. Your body works together in unity. When a part of your body is not right and all your body immediately can tell you that part of the body is not right, you break a leg and your body's going to immediately say, hey, your leg's broke. You can't do that. And all, we're not in unity anymore. You can't walk because that leg's not going to support your weight. You know, when there's disunity in the body, we feel it. 
and it's the same way in the church. We all have different ways and things that we should, things should be done. But remember, we always should bathe all things in, in prayer and seek out God's will and all. But a lot of times, that always happen the best. Or maybe we get part of the picture and somebody else gets it. Right. Yeah, there's all different scenarios that work out in the church. All because God has a means and a ways to get there. But what does have to happen is you have to make sure that you're moving towards God's will and God's goals. And a lot of times when you start putting things down into that, you realize I'm not doing it his way, I'm doing it my way. And so we it gets us back on check. Um, D.L. Moody faced a lot of criticism. He faced a lot of critics. And anytime you get you're in the public figure you get a lot of people say, Oh you made DL yeah, you need to do it this way and DL was Tell an account of a man that criticized his methods for evangelism. He is like, you're just going about it all wrong. That just isn't right, DL. It's not working out. It's not what it should be. You can do, and all. Um, whatever the whole conversation was, it doesn't give it to us, and all. But the man didn't didn't agree with it. And DL, rather than defending himself or Getting into an argument, D.L. Moody simply said, well, I'm always ready for improvement, so what are your methods for evangelism? He's like, okay, maybe I am all wet. You tell me your way, and if they're better, we'll do them, right? Here's what he got, the answer was, and this tells you the mindset of some people. The man finally says, I don't have any methods. He was criticizing another Christian, D.L. Moody, for his methods of evangelism because he didn't think they were proper or whatever. I don't know. It doesn't give us how D.L. Moody was doing it, but obviously he was pretty good because he won a lot of people to Christ. But the man didn't agree with it, so he just told him you're wrong. That's not very Christian like, and that's not very loving. You know, and it definitely doesn't create unity. And all and D.O. was doing his best to keep unity with him. And all says, well, fine, you, know, you tell me what yours are. And finally, when the guy says, I don't have none, then D.O. maybe had no answer except to say, well, then I'll stick with my methods. You know? If you can't give me something to get better or improve on, then I'll stick with what I'm doing until, you know, find something else, right? But isn't that the way a lot of people are? They're quick to cast stones saying, I don't like what you're doing here. I don't like what But when you ask them what's a better way, no. That's disunity. That tears down the love within the church. And we have to be careful with that as Christians. Unless, if you don't like the way somebody's doing it, unless you have a better way and are willing to do it yourself, or at least get in there and help them learn how to do it a better way, not your way, a better way. Truly, when I say a better way, a better way. Not a personal preference. There's a lot of people who have personal preferences about the way I preach and the way different ministers preach. Well, you know, you just shouldn't say it that way because that could be, you know, rude or that. Sometimes, I'm sorry, you got to step on some toes. But at the same time, I'm not a minister that wants to step on toes every Sunday morning. That's just not who I am. I just don't see that whipping somebody or stepping on them all the time really isn't that encouraging. So I, I believe there's got to be a mix. Now, do I get the mix right? I don't know. God knows. I don't. And I'll find out at the end, right? But the whole thing of it is, if you're going to tell somebody you can do it better, then have a better way for them to do it, not just, well, I just don't think that's the right way. I've seen so much hurt and so much destruction from that. People criticize but they're not willing to offer to help to fix, to improve, or show a better way. That does not build unity in the church. That hurts. And it's definitely not scriptural in any way, shape, or form. All right. Another evidence of love is compassion. A sincere feeling for and with the needs of others. Our English word sympathy comes from this word. So... We have to be careful that we not get hard-hearted towards each other. It's easy to get hard-hearted somebody. Well, you know, they're always having that. Some people have a rough life. I'm sorry. And we get, to get tired of hearing about it sometimes. But truly, we do have some people that live among us that really have a tough life. And I don't care. It's just tough. 
Maybe it causes it from a medical condition. Maybe it's from the way they're brought up. Maybe it's from, you know, whatever happened that they became a Christian after they got into all these other issues. It just, you know, doesn't change overnight. I mean, there's just different ways that we're going to find that we'll come across Christians, brothers and sisters who really have a tough life. Maybe they're in a marriage where, where they're saved, but their spouse isn't, so their home life ain't that great. I mean, it's just tons of what? Tons of what? I, I met a gentleman and I felt, you know, his, his entire, um, all the kids had turned to drugs. He raised them up in the church. But somebody introduced them to him. And got them all hooked. And you talk about just devastating a man. You know, it really hurt him. And so, like I say, we don't know what the other person is going through. So the last thing we need to do is become insensitive or hard-hearted to him. We should be sensitive, we should be caring, we should be compassionate. If we're truly going to be a family of God, we have to have that. 1 Thessalonians 4 9 reminds us we're taught of God to love one another. We just can't pick and choose who we want to love or how much we're going to love them. We're to love them as a brother and sister in Christ. All right. Love reveals itself in pity, and pity is not just a pity party, okay? Yeah, this is a tenderness of heart towards others. Now, in the Roman Empire, when Peter is writing this, um, it was not a quality that was admired. Matter of fact, it was despised. I know, they're very calloused about this. Um, but when the Christians came along, that began to change. And, and today, you know, we're under so much, you read the news and you know, read the prayer request about the floods and about the earthquakes and all. If we're not careful, we can become very callous towards it. We have to be careful. We have to make sure that we keep our sensitivity and our cultivation of, cur of compassion active so that we can show concern for one another. You can't just simply go through the world and say, you need to be a Christian. God loves you. It don't work. Because you're not showing them any Christian love at all. You might as well be a tape recording. It is our Christian love and all that's going to move people. All right. Next one, courtesy. Be courteous. Involves much more than acting like a lady or gentleman we've talked about. Courteous really is being humble-minded. Um, it's humility, and I'll, I don't have to be first. There's a lot of people who can't stand not to be first. You know, I was here, I need to be first. You know, I equate this to the people on the highway that can't stand to be passed. If somebody's going to pass them, they're going to speed up. Well, that's the flow of traffic. I'll go that speed, and we'll speed up, and nobody will pass me. It's not NASCAR on the interstate, people. I'm sorry. You know. Courteous. I'm willing to put somebody else ahead of me. You know, it's sort of like you're standing in the grocery line. You got a buggy full of groceries, right? And this person walks up behind you. You haven't started checking out yet. This person walks up behind you. And they have one item. What do you do? Most people, check out. And make that person wait 10, 15, 20 minutes, however long it takes to check out, bag up, pay off. When they could have just taken and allowed that person to walk by, check their one item out and be gone in about a minute. But no. They couldn't give that other person one minute. So they took 15 or 20 from them. You say, well, that's not taken from them. Well, maybe it is. You could have shown somebody 15 minutes of kindness by letting them check out, because they only have one item or maybe two. And you had an entire week's worth of groceries in your buggy. Well, I'm tired. I want to get home. Doesn't matter. 
supposed to be showing God's love first. So courteous, humility, loving others, putting others ahead of you. Then it gets into the hard part. Peter starts talking about love your enemies. Ooh. Love those that persecute you. Rejoice when you're persecuted. Oh, well, all this just goes right off the roof, right? Just around the corner from today, persecution is going to increase. There is nothing that tells us it's going to get better. As we head into the final days, Satan's going to keep pushing and pushing and pushing. Is there a chance for revival? Absolutely. There's always a chance for revival and getting things better. But the bottom line is as we end towards the last days and the church is going to be removed from this world, it's going to get tougher. The world don't want us here. And we're going to be persecuted. But persecution should not stop us from spreading the gospel. A lot of people say, well, we need to get ready to defend ourselves and hunker down and we're going to be persecuted. And we just need to ride this storm out until Jesus comes. That's not the right answer. No. Persecution's coming. But even your persecutors can be one to Christ. Think about it. Go through the scriptures. Read about your other church. And I think you'll see that time and time again. Now, we as Christians, I'm going to wrap up with this last section here. We in Christians and I live on three different levels. Okay, and that's what this last couple of scriptures, verses talk about. All right, we can turn evil... For good, which is Satan. I'm just mean and hateful, and I'm just going to, where everybody is, I'm going to be mean and hateful to them. That way they'll leave me alone, and I don't have to bother with them. That's not. You can return good for good and evil and evil, which is the human level. If they treat me good, I'll treat them good. If they treat me bad, I'll treat them bad. That's human. Or you can return good for evil. That's divine. Think of the prayer. Lord, forgive them. They know not what they do. Yep. That's divine love. Even though they wanted to kill. Stephen was killed. The stoning of Stephen. Jesus was crucified. If Jesus had acted on a human level while he was on the cross he would have called down the angels of heaven and destroyed those that were crucifying him and those that had put him there that would have been the human level reaction from a divine person but he hung on that cross and died for our sins We cannot take the attitude, an eye for an eye, and tooth for a tooth. I know it's in the scriptures, but we take it out of context so much, and it's just ridiculous. Eye for eye, tooth for a tooth is for civil government, not for Christians. We are not judge, jury, and executioner. So when you hear people say that, oh, well, what? No. That's not the way the Christian operates. That's the way the civil government can operate, and that's what God's empowered to do and to execute judgment but it's not the way we as Christians should operate we are to operate as God operates mercy if you don't like that idea then tell God to quit having mercy on you and see how long you like it I think you'll get the point very quickly God deals with us in a very merciful manner. We need to deal with other people in a very merciful manner. Peter had to learn this. 
Remember when he came to arrest Jesus, what did Peter do? He jumped up, grabbed the sword, and he cut off the servant's, you know, the servant's ear. No, they're not going to arrest you, Jesus. They're not going to take you off. Fight them and to the end. And he hauls off and cuts off the servant's ear. That's not mercy. That's worldly. Paul used every means possible to oppose the church, but when he became a Christian, because he was Saul before he became Paul, right? He never used human weapons to fight God's battles. All the things he went through, he never used human weapons to fight God's battles. When a Peter and the apostles were persecuted, what did they depend on? Prayer and God's power. Not on their wisdom, not on their strength. They relied on God. We must always remember our calling as Christians. We're, you know, and this should help us love our enemies. We operate on a mode of mercy. When we do good to them that treat bad, treat us badly. Okay? Because we're called to inherit a blessing. They aren't. We have an eternity they don't have. Why shouldn't we pity them and have mercy on them? Because unless they find Jesus, guess what? They're not going to have what you have. And they never can take it away from you. Everything they do here only stays here on earth. It does not affect eternity. We should pity our enemies. And say, I feel so bad for you. You may destroy this body, but you can't destroy my spirit. And my spirit has an eternity of blessed peace. And yours won't. Unless you know Jesus. Think about that. You have an inheritance, a blessing that they don't have. The saints and the martyrs of the church all bear witness to this mindset. Now, there's no good cut off this whole section and we'll get into more next time. But again, we should always show love. We're called to love. We're called to have the love of Christ and to share that love. And when people criticize, put you down, hate you, whatever, look on them with compassion, mercy, and pity. Because they don't have near what you got. They can take everything you have in this world, but they can't take away your greatest inheritance. All right. Our gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you. Father, give us the right heart. Give us the merciful heart, the pitying heart, the compassionate heart. That we can love others and share your love with others. Father, we praise you and give you the glory. Bless us and keep us. And Father, may we invite people to church. May we compel them to come. That they may hear the gospel. That we may witness to them in our acts of love and kindness inside and outside the church. Father, let there be unity within the church. Let the church grow and flourish and be strong in your name. Bless us and keep us until we come together again. For it's in the precious name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Alright. God bless and have a good night.